Well, happy Halloween to everybody. Uh, we do have one, pe one person dressed up here, Valerie. Hello, Valerie Dewar, with your little pumpkin hat or whatever that is. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> nice seeing everybody here again. It looks like another really big crowd. Uh, <laughs> my mother, Mary Carter, is here, and her friend, Jean Johns, family friend. We've known her forever. <laughs> and my wife, Paulette's here in the front row. And a bunch more people. To start off with, we're going to, Cheryl Munson wants to make a short announcement concerning the Bicentennial. Thank you. Let me start this announcement with a real thank you, first of all, to Clay Stuckey, who got me going on a project that the county government has, and friends have undertaken uh, to start off our bicentennial year in 2018. And that is a 2018 bicentennial calendar. And this is going to be a great calendar, 13 months, and on each... Uh, at each month, there are going to be a number of historic photos arranged sort of scrapbook style, uh, covering a whole range of themes. And the reason I'm talking to you all today is to ask for your help this week in um, directing any uh, historic photos to me at my email address or my telephone. And so if you think you have historic photos, please look for me after the meeting and I'll give you my card and I hope you will contact me because um, we have uh, need for photos especially where people know the date. So this could be photos from any year up to about 1968. One photo I'm looking for and haven't found yet is the construction of the dam at Lake Monroe. I mean, having a Having a reliable water supply was a huge point in the history of Monroe County, and I can't find that picture. So, but there are many other pictures that you might have about um, schools, churches, uh, farm life, uh, recreation, transportation, etc. So I hope to hear from any of you who could help. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Sheriff. And now we'll have a word from uh, my Minister of Propaganda, George Carpenter. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the Legion. Is this thing turned on, Mike? Yep. It is turned on? Yeah. Okay, very good. You have to eat the microphone. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to again thank the Legion. For our heaviness, uh, a good meal here. Um, how many of you are not on our mailing list, or email distribution list? Okay, then at the end of the meeting, if you see me, I'll put your name on the list if you want. It's, you're not obligated to do that. One second. Mr. My wife says I should turn around and look at the people back here. Hi, <laughs> Vernon. Okay. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. So, um, any questions, comments, criticisms for the good of the cause? Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate you being here. And we'd also like to thank Cats TV for showing up. Uh, again, like they have for the last two years now. It's been a big plus for us to get a lot of these on YouTube. Uh, and, you know, we're really glad to see them. And also the servers uh, work so hard here, so uh, appreciate them. Okay, I'm going to give just a real brief rundown of the next programs after this one. And this is kind of amazing. We have them booked now through August 28th of 2018. And we used to fly by night like a year, a uh, month ahead, <laughs> and uh, we still are, aren't we? Yes. But now, th this is incredible, we get this lineup of talent for these next few months. November 28th, Jeremy Bill Shears will do a history of local covered bridges. And he has really delved into this. He'll even have a couple models that he built, 
to set up here for people to look at. And uh, that's going to be a very good one. Now, one thing I should announce, we're not going to be here December 26th because that's the day after Christmas, and I just think there won't, won't be that many people to be able to come. So we never we hate to move it, but we're going to move it to the next week, January 2nd, uh, because I, I think that'll work out better. The day after New Year's is a lot better than the day after Christmas. Uh, Derek Ritchie is going to do that one, and he's going to show more photos that we scanned down at the Herald Times a few years ago. These are photos from the 60s, uh, and it's kind of neat to show them to the crowd because people can identify some of them. Because when we look at them, they're, they're just negatives. There's no, no stories with them. And uh, people, we've done this two or three times in the past, and people like it. January 30th, Rex Waters is going to be here. He's going to do it. Uh, he works for the DNR, and he's going to do a history of uh, Monroe Lake, where he's worked at for years and years, and he's an expert on that. He gave a program on that once about three years ago, but there were only about 20 people in our group then, so we're going to do it again. Uh, February 27th, Christine Friesel of the Monroe County Public Library will uh, return. She's given programs before and do a program on her bicentennial and timeline that she's been working with. Uh, March 27th, Dan Combs will return for a, another program. This time he's going to stick uh, mostly to the 1958, 1958, 1918 flu pandemic, which devastated most of the country and the world and Monroe County, too. So the information he's got is just fabulous on that. Uh, April 24th, Gib Apple has consented to give another program on art, the history of RCA. I did. Yay. So uh, <laughs> I think people will like that. You said you'd do it, right? No, but I didn't know the date of the 24th. Oh, is it too early? Uh, we'll all right. <laughs> we can change things around, so that's all right. May 29th, Clay Stuckey, who's sitting right here, who's given probably four or five programs already. Uh, now, what's this one on Clay's? Is it more stone mills and quarries? A little bit? No? What is it? Where are you on? Is it in West Hayden? Okay. What, what does the guy say? All right. To be decided later, but it'll be good. Uh, June 26th, Bob Hamill will return. Uh, this time to do a, another program in the, uh, the entire... Monroe County Sports Hall of Fame. Not just one segment of it, but uh, all of it. Uh, July 31st, Brad Cook of the IU Archives will be here to do his uh, part three of the history of IU. He's given two parts already. This one will take up around 1930 and it go to the, the present time of IU. And then August 28th, the fellow named David Nord will be here to do a history of Spring Mill Park. And we know it's not Monroe County, but it's awful close. <laughs> And it's really good. Uh, Clay and I went down to uh, Spring Mill to watch him give this a week or two ago. And it fits in a lot with, nicely with what we do. Now, today's speaker is Dave Williams. And incidentally, he represents the first father and son combination of presenters we've had. His son Chris gave one last December, many of you may remember, on the history of Cascades Golf Course. So, uh, uh, and they're both very good speakers. Uh, his, the last one Dave did for us was about three years ago, and it covered the history of Cascades Park. This time I asked him if he could kind of expand the program a little bit, and he graciously consented to speak also on Building and Trades Park, Third Street Park, uh, Bryan Park, and some of the other parks in town. Uh, Dave used to be with the state park system, but since 1923 he's been with Bloomington Parks and Rec. And I doubt if anyone knows more than Dave about the, our local park system. Uh, he'll give a condensed history of Cascades, Bryan, Third Street, Building and Trades Park, as well as some information on the upcoming uh, Switchyard Park, which hasn't been built yet, but they'll start work on, I think, spring of 2018. So that's probably enough of me. So here's, here's Dave.
while that's warming up. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Mike for having me back. It was three years ago that I addressed this group. And I want to say the crowd was less than half of what it is today. So kudos to all of you for uh, participating. And, and, and certainly a passion that's been mine and my son's over the years. Uh, I grew up in Bloomington. Uh, my wife grew up in Bloomington. And like a lot of Bloomingtonians, when you grow up here, you go to school here, and you can't wait to leave here to try to sow your oats somewhere else, which we did. I started out with the Indiana State Park System and worked at Turkey Run State Park and Indiana Dunes State Park, and eight years later, we couldn't wait to get back to Bloomington. So I continued to work for the State Park System for another eight years, but I commuted. I was willing to do that because both my wife and I wanted to raise our family in Bloomington, and, and we plan on staying here for a long time. And I'm pleased that my son and daughter-in-law and my grandkids are also in Bloomington as well. So very connected to Bloomington, very honored to have an opportunity to work in the, what I think is one of the premier municipal park systems, certainly in the Midwest. Uh, and a lot of the properties that I'll talk about today were ones that I recreated in as a child. And we've seen... Uh, our inventory of properties increase over time. Uh, a lot of support from various uh, city administrations, and as Mike indicated, I will be talking a little bit about our upcoming uh, kind of game changer project, certainly a landmark project uh, for my involvement in the City Parks Department, Switchart Park. Uh, so uh, let me uh, give you a little bit of background about uh, where we're going to head today and give you a little bit of information about our park system. Um, for a community our size, and keep in mind we have two parks departments in Bloomington, both city and Monroe County, both of which provide great opportunities for recreation, and uh, we're both heavily engaged in trail construction, which uh, when we survey folks like yourself or anyone else in Bloomington, visitors, residents, non-residents, trails are a big, huge part of what we provide these days because people want to get out and walk and almost everybody can get out and, and walk some distance. So we're heavily engaged in providing in our 40 sites, uh, and that includes trail systems like the Clear Creek Trail, Jackson Creek Trail, our newly opened B-Link Trail uh, behind Bender Lumber going from Henderson to Walnut Street. So we're continuing to get a lot of support to not only improve our facilities, but also expand our holdings. We're slightly over 2,000 acres in total acreage for our department. Now the big one that encompasses that number is Griffey Lake at about 1,200 acres. That's still owned by city utilities and we operate the nature preserve property, the boat rental, things of that nature. It's a very popular facility. We have about 56 full-time employees. We hire dozens and dozens of uh, temporary seasonal employees in the summer. And we're responsible for over $50 million in city assets. And as I get to it in my later stages of my presentation, you'll see that that number is about ready to, to increase substantially. Cascades Park. This was the park that I certainly grew up in. I have vivid, fond memories of going up and down the hills of Cascades Park. And it was officially dedicated in 1924, but the whole reason why the park board and the city parks department exist today was that there was a formulation of people involved in the community with the express purpose of making sure the quarry operation did not expand to the north and that was in 1921. That was the reason uh, and basically the infancy the development of our parks department was for the, the securing the property that is what is now Cascades Park. And it's a very interesting, when you go back into the ledgers and uh, handwritten or typewritten board minutes, sometimes there's, they had a secretary that was very attentive to detail and there's meticulous documentation of all the discussions and actions taken by the park board. And then you find gaps that just something happened. So in 1921, they formulated the park board with the, again, the purpose of acquiring the property. And it's, there's an interesting quote in the uh, Park Board Minutes that says, the first step was to get possession of that beautiful narrow strip of land, even if to merely hold it until we can improve it. Further destruction of the beauty of the scenery can thus be prevented. So the Park Board in 1923 
authorize the purchase of 68 acres for what was quite a deal even back then for $6,800 that started Cascades Park. And there was a, quite a flurry of, of um, development and plans, and there was going to be a major ribbon cutting, and they were going to sell flowers, and this group was going to be in there, and we assumed there was a ribbon cutting and a dedication, but again, there were no minutes taken, no publicity that we could find. But the park is approaching its 100th year, and it is literally the cornerstone of our park system and certainly one of the older and arguably one of the most beautiful natural properties that we have that befits a property that's 100 years old. So you're going to have more mature trees, things of that nature. It's still a very popular property. And it has been, for family reunions, one of the things that was very popular back in the day was um, washing your car in the creek. Now, we don't allow that anymore, but uh, as I look through a lot of the old photographs of Cascades Park, that was a very popular activity. And they had an interesting contest in the early 20s to name the park. And the park board put up a cash prize of $10. And the Chamber of Commerce put up $5, and the Indiana Daily student said, we'll give you a free subscription. So 10 people submitted the name Cascades Park and split the $15. Uh, and it was interesting, as I looked through the history, why it was called Cascade, because this would have been something the Parks Department put up. I don't know uh, what the answer there was, but uh, over the years, particularly in the 60s and 70s, it became uh, exclusively known and, and never changed back to Cascades, known as Cascades Park. Um, the park is about 60-odd acres, and that excludes the golf course, um, but it has a, a rich history because this was the entrance to Bloomington. Now, this perspective is taken roughly at Clubhouse Drive, which is the uphill, steep uphill uh, road that heads to the golf course in Kinzer Pike. So we're looking at a roughly the intersection of Old State Road 37 and Clubhouse Drive. This shot was taken in 1941. And one of the things that I personally would like to do when you have a park board member that is constantly urging me to do is replicate these limestone pillars, which were about four feet tall and uh, 10 feet high. So they were monstrously big, but this is back in the day of the, where the limestone industry was very much uh, prominent in this area. And uh, does anyone know what the highway was referred to going through Bloomington back Dixie in the day? Dixie. Dixie Highway. And so this was the route into Bloomington back in the day. Yes, Mike? Skip Chambers and I, about three or four years ago, went on a, on a, on a hunt for those pillars, thinking they would broken apart and dumped them in the... The creek there? Yeah. We, we, it didn't work. So no, we, we, uh, we looked for about three hours and gave up. We're looking for my pointer that does work. Uh, we, uh, when we built the playground in this park a few years ago, we, we did the same thing, and we also had a fear that uh, we might run into, if you see up in the upper left-hand corner, um, the sill gas, I think was what it was called. There was a filling station down there. Well, in my business, you don't want to be digging through property that used to be a gas station. So uh, we, we could verify some of the building foundations there, but we, thankfully we were able to uh, steer clear of them for the park development. Um, Cascades Park suffered through lack of use in the 60s and 70s, and I can remember vividly as a kid all of a sudden there was a neighborhood park nearby that I could ride my bike to. And I grew up going to Cascades and Bryan Park, but as the community grew, so did the provision of neighborhood parks. And we have probably 18 neighborhood parks, Park Ridge, Park Ridge East, Sherwood Oaks, Winslow. They're everywhere where there was a major residential development. There typically is a five, six, seven acre park with tennis courts, shelter houses, open play space. So the opportunities for people to go elsewhere uh, were prominent. And you think about where Cascades Park is located, it doesn't really have a neighborhood. Now, maybe the folks west on Kinzer Pike, but that's a good hike to get into lower Cascades Park. So its usage in, um, in the uh, 60s and 70s started to decline. Uh, there was a lot of problems with vandalism 
And we've uh, heavily invested in Cascades Park, certainly in the in about 25 years that I've worked for the city. Um, you may remember when there was once a drive-in theater at Lower Cascades Park. If you drive through it in the winter time, when the tree covers off, you can still see the steel structure that was the uh, the outdoor screen uh, support on kind of the north side of the hill. Uh, remember the Cascades Motorcycle Shop or junkyard or whatever you want to call it. We bought that in 2006. We bought the old Tucker Stone Mill in 2008 in the mobile home park that was next to it. And right now we are in at least conversations with the monastery folks, uh, the Tibetan monastery. Obviously the, the, the master plan has always been for Cascades Park to own the valley, so to speak. Now the IMI quarry is not going away. Um, but it's interesting that uh, I think we can have this green space not only what we call Lower Cascades Park, but we're building a trail system to get people up to Upper Cascades Park where the lion's den is and has been the shelter for many years, the skate park, obviously the golf course, which is planning a lot of renovations and improvements. <clears throat> the golf course started in 1928. And an interesting story that my son provided for me, and as Mike indicated, he's the, the golf course nut about history as well as IU athletics. So when he tells me he's researched something, I believe him. But in September 1929, there was a promotional event for the golf course. And Walter Hagen, who was a very well-known golfer at the time, was invited to make an appearance. And he played an exhibition uh, round with the, pro, the golf pro. <laughs> And the course has been realigned over the years. It is now 27 holes for, for most of its life. It was 18. And what they are doing right now is putting in Zoysia fairways. They're going to be doing some work on the clubhouse. Golf is an industry that isn't on an upward climb. It is basically declining in interest. And more often than not, particularly municipal golf courses, what you see is the land is so valuable, but when you have a fixation on one revenue producing sport and if that sport is declining in popularity or there's competition around you it's tough to pay the bills we're committed to continue to the golf course being open we're hoping while the IU course is being reconstructed we can make some improvements and get some new customers but an interesting part of the Walter Hagen story according to my son is that he was wined and dined at the Graham Hotel before he left to get on a train to go back to Chicago, and before doing so, he asked some of the locals for some moonshine to take back with him. So, <laughs> folks tale or not, I don't know. Cascades Park also uh, had some private developments alongside of it called Cascades Gardens. And this was a mix of uh, kind of amusement park, dance hall type of things. It was open next to the park in 1925. And again, the park opened in 24, so they tried to cash in on, the, on the, the public's visitation. And it closed in 28, but in those three short years, it was viewed locally as kind of an unsavory operation. And uh, my mother-in-law, who was a student in the late 40s, remembers uh, be literally being banned from going there. Uh, Co-eds could not go there by order of the Dean of Students for women. It was decreed off limits for women to go there. They had the Campbell brothers, one of which was a former mayor, owned property with a swimming pool and a baseball field just north of the park uh, on the northern edge. And in 1935, the city bought the swimming pool and I think it was 1937 erected the bathhouse, which today is referred to as the Sycamore Shelter, but back in the day was the swimming pool bathhouse. It was a problem from day one. We had a lot, and this is kind of the infancy of swimming in chemically treated swimming pools, not where a lot of you, I'm sure, grew up swimming in lakes and in, in beaches and things like that. This was a controlled environment and keeping the water sanitary was a constant battle. Every, you would read through park board minutes and it was an allocation to buy something for the swimming pool, to fix something at the swimming pool. It was trouble from the very beginning and it closed in 1945. Um, it was also during the day where Cascades in the 30s uh, was the WPA era. So a lot of the uh, WPA structures, the two shelter houses, there's a small shelter house in between the two, 
called the well shelter a lot of the creek retaining walls which we continue to struggle with today with erosion was also a problem 70 80 years ago where frequently the park board was making allocations to fix a section of the collapsed loose laid limestone wall so that's something we still deal with today probably a lot more so because if you think of Cascades Creek and if you can picture in your mind's eye 11th Street Everything 11th Street to the north drains through Miller Showers Park and Cascades Park. That's a tremendous amount of water. Think of the runoff that you get from the big apartment buildings. You don't have impervious or pervious space. You have impervious surfaces. Rooftops, parking lots, streets, sidewalks, it all rushes through Cascades Park. That's an issue we're struggling with. We're trying to determine uh, ways to continue to have road access through the park, but also trails, as well as trying to make the creek a little bit uh, more manageable with regard to erosion. Um, interestingly, back in the 30s, when there was a lot of make work projects, and particularly in limestone country, where the, uh, the raw material was very inexpensive, there was a proposal that actually went to the state legislature to encircle the entire property with the limestone wall, similar to what's today present on campus, for $293,000, it didn't pass. Uh, it was never built, but that was, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, WPA work, CCC work in Bloomington, the Allison Jukebox Center, Third Street Park, uh, was a WPA constructed facility. <clears throat> So today, we've, we've made investments. Uh, this is arguably our most popular playground facility. We've put in more parking. We've tried to improve the restroom facilities. Um, this is a, becoming a very popular uh, park for students to bike and run in as well. So in our business, we want people to come in. People come where people are. And if there's a, an inherent feeling of safety if you have crowds in your park. So we're continuing to improve on the facility uh, provision in Cascades Park, and that's our long-range plan, is to continue to make it a safe, attractive, a yet ecologically mature park for everyone in the community to use. Third Street Park, um, also known, or more accurately, known as Waldron Hill and Busker Park, AKA Third Street Park. That's certainly what I think most of us in Bloomington call it growing up in the community. I remember going to ceramics class at the jukebox. Not quite sure what my mom was thinking when she sent me there, but maybe it was just for me to, to get out of the house. Uh, it's an interesting uh, history about the acquisition of uh, Third Street Park. Um, the Waldron Hill and Buskirk um, family was involved in donating the property, and then there was also in May 1922, there was a committee formed to investigate uh, acquiring additional property from the H Hill Buskirk Waldron Estates. And Mr. Charles Waldron wrote from Washington that he and his mother would be willing to turn over their part of the land to the city, providing the city would assume the indebtedness and give the park a name honor honoring the three families. The indebtedness was approximately $5,000 and the park board made plans to acquire the property and raise the funds, and it was agreed that gypsies must be kept out of the park <laughs> and also that the land must not be used for pasture purposes. And so those were the two conditions that the park board put on. The Kiwanis Club was heavily involved in the early 20s. Um, the bandstand was erected in 1938. I'm it's, it's kind of a sad story to tell today that long after performances were discontinued in the facility about in the mid to early 60s, it was converted. I'm not quite sure how you convert a band shell into office space, but they did. <laughs> and then ultimately it was torn down in 1967. Yes, George. That's where I had my first job. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I had to go get a social security card to play in the summer band. There you go. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's hollow. There's uh -huh. some space back behind that. It actually had a basement in it. Yeah, it's, uh, we built a, a, a uh, performing arts structure uh, near the, the jukebox, so in the mid to late 90s. The, uh, a lot of people think that the, the fountain 
that uh, there's a fountain circle in the center of the park. Now, obviously, this is modern day, but does anybody know where that came from? Oh, God, you guys are sharp. It was uh, made by the Seward Foundry. That, you know, it was kind of a mass-produced fountain. Uh, we moved it. Um, I should say they moved it. This was back in the mid to late 80s. Uh, from Rose Hill Cemetery, where it was getting vandalized to the park. It operates. We put in kind of a tile uh, mosaic in the base. Uh, right now, Third Street Park is probably uh, suffering more than many of our urban parks by overuse. We have the jukebox summer programs, Kid City. It's a day camp, very popular, and that puts people into the park. Uh, the former Older American Center on Walnut Street, uh, we own and is leased to the project school. So this is their recess, their recreation site. And with that, with concerts and everything else, it's, the park's taking a beating. Some of the trees in there are taking a beating. Uh, but we have some funds through a recently issued park general obligation bond to, to invest some money into improvements to Third Street Park. I have a question. Yes. When I, I grew up down there, there mm -hmm. was a big bell. Mm -hmm. Somewhere down there. Is that still, still there? there. Still what, there. What was the purpose of that bell? Was that the fire bell? I think it was. There's a there's an inscription underneath it. Yeah. But it is still there. And that was a, the approximate location of where the um, the stage of the, the band shell was. But it is still there. It is literally beyond that in the jukebox. Enormous bell. Yeah, it, it is still there. Uh, the park pool uh, was constructed in the early 60s, uh, I'm sorry, in 1927, forgive me. So we did, we did, we did have a uh, period of time where there were two swimming pools, the one struggling in Lower Cascades Park and, and the one in Third Street Park. It was the old style, and I remember when I started my state park career, there were remnants of these 20s, 30s era swimming pools, and most of them were round. You don't see that today. But I remember swimming here uh, and swimming at Bryan Park Pool, which was opened in 58. Uh, but this one, uh, also as swimming pools have a lifespan, you can't put concrete underwater very long and expect it to last. So it, there's a lifespan to everything. And the park, uh, the pool was permanently closed in 1967. But in 1933, admission was 15, 15 cents. If you wanted a bath suit, that was 35 cents. And lifeguards received a salary of $12 per week. Uh, but this was an old facility. I remember it well. Uh, again, between ceramics class and being dropped off the swimming pool, I think my mom liked to drop me off at Third Street Park. Um, not much has changed in this park. We did kind of a community playground build here. At some point in time, everybody familiar with what they refer to as the Kirkwood Big Dig? Remember when Kirk was, yeah, this is, oh gosh, 10 years ago now, closed down Kirkwood because of a stormwater tunnel. A lot of that stormwater tunnel has sti is still original. Laid rock instead of concrete culverts. There's another section that will eventually come down Lincoln Street and slice through this playground. And then we'll rebuild the playground and make it better when, when that the utilities department project is over. But Third Street Park... Uh, will continue to be the host of Shakespeare in the Park, Kid City Camp, and outdoor performances. Bryan Park, arguably our most popular property uh, for a whole host of reasons. It was acquired in 1951. This is an aerial photograph of 61, and what you'll see is kind of the layout of facilities that exist today, the swimming pool, swimming pool parking lot, Baseball fields, parking lots over here, a lot of open space, about 32 acres, surrounded by residential development. And it is, you know, with some improvements, restrooms added, tennis courts added, basketball courts added. It has largely uh, remained uh, unchanged. The swimming pool, as I mentioned, uh, was constructed in 1958. The park was uh, purchased for a dollar and was named in honor of William Lowe Bryan, the president of Indiana University from 1902 to 1937. And the park itself opened in 57. Now, the swimming pool is aging. We've put money into it. We're keeping it afloat. 
I remember in high school, I went to Bloomington High School, and we, I don't know how we made this work, because your classes were like 45 minutes, got on a bus, went to Brian Poole, changed clothes in an unheated bathhouse, and then went into the bubble, or what we refer to as the cave, uh, and swam during gym class. And then I was a member of the swim club, and we would practice there, and whenever the swim coach wasn't in the, he was a smoker, so we knew every now and again he was gonna go outside. And when he went outside, there were two heaters at either end, and that's what everybody wanted, because you're almost frostbit. It just, icicles were hanging from the ceiling. This was an idea that just really didn't work really well. Okay? It was uh, taken down in the early, mid-70s. Uh, it was an opportunity, obviously, before high schools these days have pools, the YMCA. There's all kinds of indoor swimming opportunities. Back in the day, there wasn't, but this was the only opportunity. Uh, we've added a water slide. It's a very popular facility. But keep in mind, too, swimming pools are also a trend that is starting to stabilize because school vacations, they're, they're letting them out later and bringing them, you know, the Memorial Day, the Labor Day model may work in Wisconsin and Michigan. And I think I'm told in some of those more tourist-centric states may actually be by law that you can't start school before Labor Day because the kids are working at all these tourist attractions. Well, here, you know, gosh, kids are going back to school second week of August. That cuts into your revenue for swimming pools. So uh, we have literally gone to the extent of heating the water in Bryan Pool so we can get a few more people swimming in May and that usually, even by Memorial Day, first week of June, the water's still not real warm. So we're trying to do everything we can to keep the attendance up. Uh, but the pool, we have two very old swimming pools. Uh, this is 58, Mills Pools, circa 62. Uh, these are some things along with Frank Southern Ice Arena that are kind of the, they're out there. One of these days, we're going to have to develop plans on what we're going to do. And Bryan Park is probably famous most for its playgrounds, its walking trail. Uh, we invest heavily in playgrounds. Uh, this is a way to get people to come and stay in parks. We try to create not only the play amenities for kids, but also other creature comforts that allow us as parents and grandparents to stay in a park for a while. But Bryan Park is certainly uh, our most beloved, I think, and certainly most popular city park. About 32 acres, all told. <clears throat> Building Trades Park. This has a very interesting in, uh, history, and I was comparing notes with Mike uh, before the presentation. Um, oh, I just forgot to mention, too, back to Brian Poole. I got my picture in the Herald Telephone one year. Now, this is how old I am, diving into Brian Poole. First kit to dive into the pool. I want to say it was 60 six, something like 67, but you can't dive into swimming pools anymore because of the potential for head injuries. But I remember being the first one in line, and I don't know, by happenstance, there was a, a photographer there. I wish I could find the thing, but I, I'm not telling tall, tale, tale, tall tales here. I was the first kid to jump in the pool, and I was pretty proud about that. I spent my whole summer in Bryant Pool. All right, on to, on to Building Trades Park. Everyone know where this is located? Across from the hospital on 2nd Street? Okay. Across from Hunter School. Across from Hunter School. Um, it is an interesting history. It was once home of the, uh, the South Side Stone Company and the Blue Hole. I'm sure many of you know Don Shiflett. Uh, I spent a couple hours talking to Don about the history of the site. He was born in the house that we have since acquired and at, it tore down, and, and Don is, I believe, in an assisted living center now. But we worked with this family to expand the park, but he remembers swimming in what he called the Blue Hole, which was a quarry pit. And boy, back in the day, quarries were part of my summer vacation as well. Uh, it was filled in, this is 1949, and, and I, 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 yes. That, that loop right in the very center of the picture? Right here? That was our driveway. Oh, the, Mike lived right across the street. This is before the hospital and parking lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
The park was acquired in 1949. It is about six acres. Uh, we've uh, done some work on the basketball courts. We've done um, some work on the playground. Uh, this is kind of a one of those parks that it has the community park characteristic, like Bryan, but also uh, a very coveted and protected neighborhood park. And uh, we don't have a lot of plans to do much of anything. One of the things that that is always very popular in any park system is recreation space that's flat and open. You know, so if your soccer team needs a place to practice or your baseball team, I was sharing with Mike that in my youth, the pass, punt, and kick was held here every year. And I had a neighbor a couple streets over by the name of Dave Reeve, who, well, we were playing tackle football in somebody's front yard. Dave had a goal post in his backyard. He lived on Clifton. I lived on Nancy Street. And he would kick field goals endlessly. He ended up kicking for Notre Dame. And he'd win every year. He'd win this contest. But he was kind of the last straight-on style kickers instead of the soccer style kickers. But Dave got a scholarship to kick for Notre Dame. It was pretty cool. Um, this park is uh, one of three, well, actually four, urban parks. People's Park. We've read a lot about People's Park over the last several months. Seminary Park, same thing. Building Trades and Third Street Park. And it, it's becoming a challenge to maintain and improve and make safe these uh, locations. I think all of us, certainly, I applaud uh, our efforts and the administration's effort to just basically draw a line at People's Park and saying this type of behavior is not going to be allowed to occur again. And we've, um, we've worked very hard to reclaim our ownership in People's Park. Uh, there's a beautiful new mural. We're looking at all kinds of different programming, improving the lighting. Uh, but people have to be comfortable when they come to a city park. Seminary Park is a challenge because of its proximity to where other services are provided. Um, but we also have some improvements planned for People's Park. So ongoing investments, <coughs> programming, or what pe bring people into parks. But admittedly, we have a... a I wouldn't even characterize it as a big city challenge, but managing the behaviors of certain people is challenging because we are not in the law enforcement business, but we do everything we can to make sure our parks are clean and sanitary and well maintained. The last park I wanted to talk to you about is the one that. Hi, Dave. Yes. Yes. Um, I work a lot with old newspapers, and there was an article about a park south of Bloomington that was devoted strictly to colored people, and I believe that was the Building Trades Park. What do you know about that, if anything? The only, um, on that subject, the only thing I've ever stumbled upon is not a southern park. There was an action, there was a board agenda item in the 20s for Cascades Park as to whether or not to allow black children to swim in the pool. And as I recall, the park board minutes reflected that they kind of punted the issue to the city council. And I honestly don't recall what the outcome was. I've never come across anything that said this is a segregated park or this is for this group only. But in that particular facility at Cascades Park, it was very detailed on the agenda and the minutes of a park board meeting. But it was the swimming pool only in nothing, Cascades nothing Park. Nothing like that was ever in that building trades park because I grew up in that park myself. I never went on. Yeah, I, I've never come across that. And, and as I indicated, sometimes there's extraordinary levels of detail on the history of parks and actions taken by the park board. Other times it's just incomplete information. But that, I would like to see that. I, I have not come across that yet. <clears throat> Uh, what's now known as Reverend Butler Park, yes, 9th Street Park over by Fairview. Uh, I didn't include that in my presentation. It is um, an interesting story there. Everyone familiar basically where that is, uh, Fairview and, and 9th? Um, we basically, uh, there used to be a big railroad presence there. There was a kind of a mechanical equipment shop that took up about half of the park. And doing some research, we realized that basically the railroad was encroaching. And this is often the case when you go through old records, you find out, wait a minute, something was supposed to happen here, and they did it. You were supposed to vacate by a certain year. 
And this was early in my career with the city of Bloomington, but we had some fairly confrontational discussions with uh, the railroad who ultimately vacated the site. And we've got community gardens there. Mother Hubbard's cupboard has a greenhouse there, a uh, new playground. We removed the tennis courts years ago. Um, there is now a direct link trail to the Beeline Trail, and we have actually neighbors on the other side of the railroad tracks in the Habitat for Humanity uh, project. So yes, that's uh, it's about nine acres, a very popular neighborhood park. Not as much these days for softball or baseball, uh, but gardening has really taken over as a use for that facility, just up the street from the Banneker Community Center. Oh, there always is during alongside railroad property. Yeah, yeah. We we the question was about homeless encampments, and we fight that all the time. And we have taken a fairly aggressive approach that uh, if they're on our property, they're going to be asked to leave, and if they're not leaving voluntarily, we're picking up the articles and taking them. Uh, we don't operate camping facilities, so um, and that's one of the areas that we have to keep a lot of eyes upon. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention was Switchyard Park. Everyone have a geographical location here, the old railroad, the McDowell Switchyard, Monon Railroad, uh, CSX Railroad, bounded on the north by Grimes, um, not quite to Rogers Street, um, but I'll get into the, a little bit of the details of our expansion there. And it went all the way down to Country Club, and then the western or the eastern border would be Clear Creek, not quite to Walnut. Um, this was uh, not quite frankly in the heyday, it was 1949, if you look at aerial photographs back in Gibbs day with RCA in the 60s, where the two big warehouses that still exist today, you see a lot more cars, a lot more activity affiliated with manufacturing in Bloomington, particularly RCA. My dad worked his entire career for RCA and I remember him taking me to the, what is now the, uh, the warehouse church on South Rogers Street. It's about a 200,000 square foot building and I remember my dad taking me in there when I was a young kid and just seeing boxes of TVs to the ceiling, ready to ship out of town. Well, as the railroad's customer base declined, so did the need for the switchyard in the rail corridor. So the first acquisition by the city was to acquire the three mile corridor that is now the Beeline Trail. It runs to Adams Street, right through the heart of downtown, right behind City Hall. And I was uh, having a conversation with a, uh, another individual about just how much development has occurred and is occurring on the Beeline, the Hyatt Hotel, the Foundry Project, the Beeline Station, Hopscotch Coffee. It's exactly what we hoped it would be. We would revive an area of our, our extended downtown from what was well over 120, 100, George, how many years? 150 years? 130 years as far as railroad activity from this? The, the, the railroad yard went in before the turn of the last century. Yeah, yeah. So it, a huge history of railroad and limestone industry, and now what is serving that area is a recreational trail um, that runs all the way to Country Club. That was our first acquisition. And then we kind of sat back and waited for CSX to determine what they wanted to do, and ultimately they sold us 27, almost 28 acres of the rail yard. And that became kind of the birthing of let's do a park here. And that's you know, a, a early in the Cruzan administration, and it was actually started by Mayor Fernandez. So at, at government, we don't move real fast on a lot of things. So it often takes a lot of time, new leaders, new elected officials, get the money. But we acquired the, the funding and we are heavily into the design following a master plan project for community input in 2012 to develop this property into a major new park. And let me give you a little orientation here. This is the warehouse that I talked about. This is Hillside. Now, as we all know, Hillside does not go through. It stops at Walnut. There's the uh, tattoo parlor. It used to be Southside Cafe. That's on the corner here goes all the way up to Grimes. This property was acquired about three years ago, was locally known as the Triple C property. This was where years ago you used to take your county recycling 
and then for years was um, semi trailers, shipping containers, storage sites. Before that was Griffith Motor Express, was it not? Yes, it was. Oh, okay. So uh, there was a willing seller, actually, was a retired fireman. We bought this property uh, to develop the park's entrance off of Roger Street with parking. And this, we're going to keep one building. Whoops up here, and you may have read something about an affordable housing project, which is a, a big agenda item with the city administration, that will take place here. Um, we are develop. we're trying to provide everything we can in this facility. It's long and lean and goes nowhere near Country Club, which is off the page. Um, we still do not own property that CSX still owns. I certainly remember when I moved back to Bloomington, having to wait for the crossing of Country Club, like three tracks wide. And remember, there was a creosote plant oh, on yeah. both sides. Of, well, it's heavily contaminated property. Someday, they'll clean it up sufficiently to where there might be a parking lot entrance or something like that to the park. But let's start from Grimes Lane. Um, there is one old railroad building there, a very nondescript building. It was briefly used as a passenger depot, but it wasn't really a station. Um, it will become a police substation for the Bloomington Police Department. They will literally have staff and officers who will work out of this building. So the entrance off of Grimes Lane into this parking area here uh, will have a noticeable presence of law enforcement on site. And when we did solicit community input, this was one of the concerns. How are you going to make this park safe for me? Yes, sir. There, there is all the time, and particularly this time of the year. And we move them in. We have what are called the DROs, the uh, downtown resource officers. If you see a uniformed police officer in Bloomington that has a white shirt, they, are, they work with the homeless population as much as possible, try to get them services or get them directed to the right location, and also, quite frankly, be fairly strict with them by saying, you can't camp here. So we continue to clean this area up, particularly on the edges down by the creek. But we'll have the police station up here. Uh, those of us that used to play tennis back in the 70s when everybody played tennis, but we don't have the knees to play tennis anymore. <laughs> How many people play pickleball? Anybody? Any? Okay, there's a handful of them. Trust me, it's taking over the world. Pickleball <laughs> is the next great thing. We offer it at Twin Lakes Recreation Center. We're going to have two pickleball courts here. Um, bocce ball. Anybody play bocce ball? We have an international population in this community. We want people that, from the IU crowd that don't necessarily venture out of their comfort zone around campus to come to this property. So we'll have bocce. We're going to have fitness stations. One of the other emerging trends is that people want to you know, not lift hundreds of pounds of weights, but some mobility exercises. They now make outdoor exercise equipment. So we'll have fitness stations for people to not only pull off the Beeline Trail walking, it's a mile and a quarter from Grimes to Country Club. Two and a half miles for a lot of folks is a pretty comfortable number. So we're trying to, again, not only have you walk that stretch back and forth, but also stay a little bit at the uh, fitness stations here. Community gardens, kind of event lawns, if we want to have a car show, a dog show, an art show. We can have some revenue opportunities there. All Another these, skateboard park is coming in. Yes, sir. Are all these little green fingers that go out into the neighborhoods actually city property? Or no, that's just green space. What, what is outlined in city property is this black line here. That is the 27 acres plus the acreage who, over who here. Who owns or controls all those fingers of green space? I don't know. I'd have to look on a map, a parcel map to see. Uh, but th these are usually like green strips that run between properties or alongside roads, but we only own what's outlined here. So we also own a lot of spurs from the railroad, for example, the one that used to service the Herald Times and brought bulk newspaper to the Herald Times. Uh, but there's been some redevelopment here. We'll, going back to the development, we'll have a skateboard park. This is, we are opening up the creek that historically has gone under the switchyard, we are what's called today daylighting. You can add a lot of ecological health and vitality as well as some visual interest by bringing a stream to the surface instead of not even knowing that you're walking over a stream. So there will be some daylighted stream sections here, a stage for performances here. This is about what we call our event lawns is about five acres. 
So if you think of Taste of Bloomington, where there's a couple stage acts going on at each time the showers, pause it, estimated crowds at you know over a weekend of about eight to ten thousand people. This may be the site for those future big events. Uh, a very nice stage facility will will look out into the park. A dog park here. I, I tell people I've been doing parks for 40 years, and I never thought I'd see a skateboard park but they're still very popular, and not just with kids, with people my age and, and younger. I never thought we'd see a dog park, but it's like the number one vote getter for this park. A place to take your dog, take your dog off a leash legally, and run him around. We have one at Ferguson Dog Park off of Stone Mill Road towards the old city utilities water plant. Very popular facility. The third thing was a doggy drinking fountain. Okay, and I'm thinking, okay, I get it. Dogs are, come, are like your kids, you want to bring them along, you want to get Sparky a drink, I get it. So I've been in the business a long time, nothing surprises me anymore. But we'll have a dog park as well. The flagship, the, the, the areas where we're putting the most money and attention is right here, which we're calling the platform. This is an 11,000 square foot open air but yet climate controlled pavilion. So uh, we already have an interest in, in a winter farmer's market, which we don't operate, but the folks at Harmony School, the old Elm Heights Elementary operate, they're looking for more space. We're talking to them. We want to have a wedding reception there, a banquet hall. This will be a multi-purpose facility that will have a lot of glass and garage doors that can be open air like a shelter or can be enclosed for this time of year if you need a climate controlled event. Um, this will be a splash pad. Everybody know what a splash pad is? Okay. Uh, there's a distinction here. A water playground is where the water kind of just dumps on you. You know, buckets and animals and caricatures just springing up water. This shoots the water up. It's all, you can choreograph it, you can put creative lighting on, but the advantage is in the off season, you shut it down, you have a plaza that you can hold events on. This is going to be a hit, and quite frankly, there's a lot of communities, not unlike us, that are facing the aging swimming pools. What do you do? You're going to build a brand new swimming pool, four, five, six million dollars, all the bells and whistles that go with new day swimming pools. A lot of communities are going to these splash pads or water playgrounds where everybody gets wet, but you don't have to know how to swim. So your lifeguard expense goes down, your chemicals go down, and it's uh, for many communities this is what they offer. Well, we'll continue to have two swimming pools, but we'll have a playground there as well. Yes, Mike? Uh, so is that similar to what's at Cars Park? Yeah. Yes, yes, what yeah. Pictures yeah. Um, there'll be a shelter with restrooms and changing facilities here. And of all the things that I think, and I'm starting to really relate to this as a grandparent, um, are playgrounds. And this will be a spectacular playground. And it will have the rubberized surface, which, again, parents and grandparents love to see for their kids, because not only is there cushioned safety for falls and spills, but they don't come home with sand in their pockets and their shoes and things like that. It'll have climbers. It'll have, it'll have porch swings. If, those of you who just want to keep an eye on the six, seven-year-old, you don't have to be right next to him, but when you want to keep an eye on him, we're going to have porch swings. So you can swing and relax and hopefully not fall asleep, but that's okay too. Um, and again, the whole idea is to keep you there. If we can keep you there for more just a half an hour trip in the playground, but if we can keep you there and you bring lunch, you bring dinner, that's, that's the ingredients for a successful park. We'll have a shaded uh, seating area here in, in, in Europe. They call it a bosque, a very densely shaded big tree area. We're going to have movable tables and chairs, big long tables that you can reserve, or short tables. Uh, we're working with the chess club. They want to you know, facilitate chess, whatever. We'll give you the tables you program and then teach people how to do chess. The other thing that this park will have that no other city park has is Wi-Fi. So, you want to, it's a beautiful summer day, and your office is tired of having your staff meetings in the back conference room, come here. You know, we're hoping Cook Pharmac is not that far away, or whatever they call that, Cat 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 let them come down here, it's within walking distance. 
facilitate that. That's a park user that maybe we can bring to this park because now they can do their business because we have Wi-Fi service. So a lot of facilities, a lot of parking, um, but that is, this project is scheduled to break ground next spring. Uh, yes. Any areas for bringing a picnic basket? The yes, shelter? there will be um, areas, well, you can picnic on the ground wherever you want or on tables that will provide sporadically throughout the park. But there'll be a shelter here. There will be, you can picnic here alongside the pavilion. There will also be a canopy on the splash pad building here. And there's going to be some smaller, more intimate, shaded structures for you to sit, like in the porch swing, and eat your sandwich. It's not necessarily at a picnic table, because some folks have a difficult time getting in and out of picnic tables. Okay. So, well, you provide as many seating options as you can, again, to get you to be able to be comfortable and stay for a while. Is there any chance of having the city put up concession stands or leasing out property for that to be built? With? Well, we're we're exploring that possibility. At one point in time, we thought um, the police station would have um, an opportunity for rented space. Now it looks like it's if we offer that, it'll probably be in the concession building down there. Concessions kind of a mixed bag. It depends what you offer. There's always a private sector, you know that okay, we have a captive audience. And so what we're looking at more closely is facilitating food trucks. Yes. So what do you need? Well, we need an ample parking space, a place for our line to roll up to our van or our truck, maybe some water, high amperage electricity. We've got that covered. We're hoping that we can bring people down there. So again, take your lunch at Switchyard Park, bring it, relax in the playground and the porch swing, or buy it off a, a food vendor on site. Yes. Considering that the railroads that own property like this are pretty cavalier about some of their environmental contamination, has there been a thorough study of this property to make sure you're not buying into a toxic sun site? There, there, there is and there has been. There was substantial soil investigations and sampling done before we bought the property, uh, before we bought the B-Line corridor, before we constructed the B-Line. And we have been working with the Indiana Brownfields Program, which is an arm of the Department of Environmental Management. And what we will be dealing with are two things. One is uh, coal ash, which obviously is a, is a byproduct of uh, com uh, locomotion combustion. And it was used as a structural fill material to depths of four feet or more. It is literally that deep. Well, think about it, well over 100 years. It's a free material that has some structural integrity. Um, there are areas that has never really been explained clearly to me where there are higher levels of contaminants in a coal ash area than, well, I know, we've done sampling to 8 to 10 feet. We know where the fuel depots were, we know, we know where the oil house was from historic photos that we concentrated those sampling. We will haul out what we call hot spots or petroleum contamination, and the entire park, depending on what the use is, will be covered with clean soil. Now, if you're out in the concert lawns, okay, maybe Junior sits there and digs and digs, or the dog digs and digs. We don't want to undercover what's lying underneath. If we can keep it covered, then the, the risk to human health is next to nothing. We don't want to call our waste to someone else's backyard. But if it's a high concentration of contamination, and we have literally pinpointed those locations, and knowing full well that anything that was in a railroad yard or somewhat adjoining a railroad yard, uh, we have contamination on the Wee Willys site. Well, who would have thought that? Well, if you look back at what it was back in the 40s and 50s, a metal plating site, there's going to be some contamination. But we quite frankly, won a, a state award for environmental cleanup for the B-Line. We will have a covenant on this property, which is the highest bar that can be set for environmental cleanup, and there will be a safe, reusable park. And one, quite frankly, you know, I'm not going to beat the government drum here, but this property has a lot of challenges. It's floodplain, it's floodway, it has contamination, and government's going to take it on and make it a valuable community asset. So we'll be underway. 
in spring of 2018, about a year and a half's worth of construction. The mayor's made it very clear that he wants to cut the ribbon before the end of 2019. I think we'll probably be in the park finishing up plantings and what they call the contractor's punch list in 2020. But this is the, the all-consuming project on my plate for the last five years and beyond. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any final questions. Yes, ma'am. Not yet. What was the question? Uh, is, will there be a way to go from Rogers to Walnut through the park? This was probably the most heavily talked about item um, in our master plan discussions. We had a whole host of public meetings. You know, well, surely Hillside Drive is now going to go through. We, ironically, when we did kind of just some engineering studies and, and where you would end up is kind of through that McDowell neighborhood to Rogers Street. There were arguments on both sides, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the answer to your question is no, not right now. But the hillside right-of-way will be unencumbered with any permanent building. So if someone 10, 20 years from now wants to extend hillside through the park, there won't be a shelter house or a, or a skate park in its way. We've, we've opened up that right-of-way to allow that future road construction. That, that's a very valid point. And one of the things that we were pretty steadfast on is we wanted parking on the periphery. We wanted to keep vehicles out of the park as much as possible. But that hillside drive was absolutely the most heavily debated topic. Yes, ma'am. What's left behind where we really Right here. Right in here, uh, there is a bridge and then down to the creek, steeply down to the creek. But there was uh, all, all we bought the Wee Willie's property a couple of years ago, I think. Now, don't be confused. We are not. We did not buy. Parks did not buy night moves. Despite <laughs> what you read in the paper, we didn't buy that. That was not. It says for switch our park entrance. The administration has some hopes of of having some redevelopment of the area outside the park. We did not buy, although the city of Bloomington, whom I represent, owns the facility, it is not part of the Switch Our Park development. Yes, sir. Uh, I never did hear an explanation why they put, what some people refer to as light Fernandez at Miller Showers Park. Why they tore down the trees, shredded them, mm -hmm. took out the park equipment and all that. Amen. Well, I'm going to kind of contradict that <laughs> assumption. Um, the part that has certainly been one of the more controversial projects that we ever did, certainly in my tenure, was the most controversial project. The one of the reasons why it was built the way it was built was to hold and detain and slow down stormwater. We knew then what was going to come in the downtown. And I mentioned all the impervious surfaces and look at all the that has happened in the last 10 years in our downtown. So Cascades Park was linked to that. Water quality going through Cascades Park. If you race it through a park, as it did and heavily eroded Miller Showers, I used to have some pretty spirited arguments with people about you literally couldn't get across, you could get across the creek one day, the next week you couldn't because it would widen it by five feet of erosion. Were there trees? Yes. There were 66 trees removed, unfortunately, on Earth Day, which is on May. <laughs> but a lot of those trees had overhead power line clearing, so they were chopped. Today, there's over 220 trees in the park. The, the biggest, I think, thing that's still a hard sell is native plants. Many of you, if you garden or if you landscape around your house, you know it's vibrant colors and flowers and their annuals. We have heavily gone to native plants. We will in the switchyard. There's some ecological benefits, not only for our area, but pollinating bees, birds, things of that nature. Um, Cascades Park or uh, Mill Showers Park, the toughest thing for us is when we go through a period like we just came out of in the summer. We went through what, three, four week drought and you see scummy ponds. And the problem we have is the storm water that enters that park at three locations is nutrient-rich runoff. I mean, all of us or many of us may treat our lawns. Well, that washes off. It's high levels of nutrients that will grow everything. 
So we're, we're going to look at more aeration to keep the, the algae growth down. Uh, but that park, gosh, the 10 years that it's been in existence, my phone used to ring off the hook. And now, not quite so much because it's a park that has matured. But it is, we call it a park with a purpose. And stormwater management is the purpose of that park. Now, it's a gateway. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, that only took 10 years. Uh, uh, it's a gateway park that uh, I think in, in we're working very hard at improving the appearance because it does need some help, particularly at certain times of the year. Also, a follow-up on that. Yeah. Isn't there some fish, aquatic wildlife, that could be put in there to be stocked to eat that scummy stuff? Yeah, until the first rain. And then they're downstream. Oh, we've had, we trapped beavers. And I don't mean beavers, I mean beavers. Beaver. Snarling, nasty, ferocious beavers we've taken out to Leonard Springs Nature Park. Uh, snapping turtles. Yes. But it, it, at first heavy rain, and it washes them downstream. So we've looked at, at, at the way there is a certain type of carp that will ingest the algae, but it, it's not a pond, it's not a lake. It, it fills up, it dumps, it fills up, it dumps. And when we have frequent predictable rains, the water moves downstream, keeps it fairly presentable as far as algae. Yes, ma'am. The skate park that is on Kinder, uh -huh. is that a city park? Yes. Okay, is that, how many skate parks will there be after? Two. Just two. The, that one is the bowl, so you're down in it. This one will be, and I don't know anything about skateboarding, but we're, there's a local group that we're working heavily with, is a street-style course. So railing, steps, stairs, all the things that we don't want them to skate on, like downtown, <laughs> that's what we'll offer in the built environment here. And I, I must say, as far as a constituency, the skate park folks have been great to work with. Yeah, there's going to be an occasional knucklehead that's going to graffiti or do something, but um, they have been, they have ownership in their facility. They work hard to uh, keep people engaged, keep kids safe, and it's been a really big success story for us on Kinder Pike. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the nasty, uh, large beavers that snarl. Why did you relocate them on our road? On your road? <laughs> our road. Road. Where is where is that? Road. What road is that? Leonard Springs it used to be. It's South Leonard Springs now. One of three South Leonard Springs, but it was Old Leonard Springs before. So and you. Nature Park is right down the road from us. Why did you bring them to our neighborhood? <laughs> we brought them to your neighborhood, or we brought them to the park. We brought them to Leonard Springs Nature Park. That's on our and, road. Is what I'm trying to tell you. Why did you relocate them to my Road. So they got out from the park onto your road? I don't know. They might be. <laughs> I don't know that I have an answer on that. If it's the same beaver, my apologies. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, if it's on our property, if it came from our property, give me a call. Any other gift? Can you give us two minutes on RCA Park? Yes. Uh, RCA Park, uh, through Gibbs noble efforts over several years, uh, was changed from Thompson Community Park to RCA Park. Uh, it was never a site where that RCA inhabited, but it would, correct me if I'm wrong, was about... Yeah, RCA is 48 acres, I think, that I use, or I'm sorry, RCA owned for years and gifted to the city in the early 1990s. Um, it is a park that uh, literally what you see out there in tennis courts, pickleball courts, playground, restroom is 12 acres of 48 acres. But that is a park that is rapidly developing around it. We have the new summit, relatively new summit elementary school. A lot of the property off of Weimer Road is in play for future development, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, future opportunities for trail connections uh, on that side of the park. But uh, hats off to Gibb and his very persistent efforts to, to accurately and, and I think appropriately rename that park to commemorate 
what should have been named RCA Park and Thompson is, uh, and thankfully the, they did not give us any resistance to, to renaming the park. Yes, sir, in the back. <laughs> the decision was made by the Utility Service Board. We operate the Wapahani Mountain Bike Park, but as was indicated in the paper, um, Utilities has owned several impoundment dams over the years. Twin Lakes Sports Park, the softball fields, was once a city water supply. Leonard Springs Nature Park was once a city water supply. Griffey Lake was once a city water supply. All of these have become, in some manner, shape, or form, a park facility, a park property. The problem with, um, and having gone to the Boy Scout camp back in the 70s, late 60s, the dam is inspected more frequently than it was 10 years ago because of development that has occurred around it and downstream from it. Basically, um, the DNR basically said, you have to bring this dam up to standards or you've got to remove it. Now, the Utilities uh, Service Board, and I think what is a fair approach, has basically said, we don't have any skin in the game over here anymore. We're not pumping water from it. People who pay for water, sewer, sanitary rates, your, your monthly utility bill, don't have skin in the game at Wapahani. Um, so the dam will be removed. That is being bid literally as we speak. I expect to them to start um, working on that property by the end of the year, finishing up by spring. We will still have a 32-acre park, but it will be more of a wetland area where the lake bottom was than exists today. Yes, Mike. Going way back to Cascades Park, uh, probably a lot of people don't realize that the first pool that was put in there was put in by Tom Hall, who was quite a... A, a uh, notorious a character from what I hear, yes. And that first pool was salt water. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, I don't it, think it stayed salt water that long. No, I don't think it did. And and again, the, the, the nemesis for that pool was clean, keeping it clean. Now, I've heard rumors, but I can't kind of substantiate it. Maybe you can or some research. That I, I'm told there was a meat packing plant, a slaughterhouse down in Cascades. Now, if they discharge directly to the creek, okay, I can see where that would denude the creek water quality, but it wouldn't have had anything to do with a swimming pool that, you know, took potable water out. Uh, I got, yes? Uh, also, Hoagie Carmichael played at the opening of that Cascades Garden. He did. Yeah. Hoagie Carmichael and his collegians. Oh, yeah. He was still in college, and nobody really knew who he was back then. I'll take one more question. Yes, ma'am. I remember years ago when Cascades Park had some Cessnas down there. Whereabouts? When us kids were little, we'd go and we'd got in airplanes we could gather, mm -hmm. and the girls were late, mm -hmm. and we'd never between the two shelter houses? Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was a, mo a, a, a small scale ride, kid rideable railroad. I remember. I did, I, that was on the other side of the street. Yeah. There's been all kind. There used to be a caretaker's house in the park uh, years ago. You know, 100 years, you're going to see a lot of changes. And, you know, the town has kind of surrounded it now. We're, in my youth, or in your youth, there wasn't near the development that there is. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.